geneticist by training, a PhD from the University College of London, a postdoc uh, also from there, and uh, she worked at King Faisal University before she joined us, and we're very fortunate to have us. Has a lot of experience in the eye field, and I'm going. She's going to speak to us on some of the genetic aspects of translation research. Dr. Lee. Thank you, Dr. Deepak. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today I'll be talking to you about the uh, genetic applications in ophthalmology um, and the um, research that we are doing uh, currently in the research department. I'll take you through the basic um, steps to start uh, doing research uh, in genetics. So uh, what kind of applications we can use for genetics in, uh, in ophthalmology research? First, genetics helps to identify disease causative genes or mutations. So we can use genetics to um, uh, clone uh, novel genes or to identify mutations in genes that we already uh, know. Genetics can provide us with confirmation for clinical diagnosis. So whenever there is a, a question on, on the clinical uh, case, we can actually confirm that with genetics. So there is no gray area in genetics. It's either black or white. It's either there or it's not there. We can use uh, genetics to uh, study genotype-phenotype correlation, um, uh, which is like I think is uh, very widely used in um, uh, most of clinical uh, research. Uh, we use it also for uh, patient counseling, and uh, genetics helps to set up screening and prevention protocols whenever we can actually do that, such in uh, cases of autosomal recessive, which is the um, most common uh, genetic diseases in the Saudi population. So we can uh, provide uh, screening for um, 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 individuals who are, at, uh, who are at risk, and we can provide families with pre prevention protocols to avoid having um, um, more affected children in their families. So um, the first steps wha that we do for uh, when we want to do uh, genetic uh, to study genetic conditions is we um, first try to identify the genetic uh, condition that we w uh, we want to investigate. So it's either like a novel phenotype, something that you've seen for the first time. It's a syndromic case that you has not been described before. Uh, could be the something like you know a common disease, but has a, a certain representation. So in either way, a clinician would see it as uh, interesting to be um, uh, a subject of study. Then what we do is like, you know, we collect family history and pedigree to identify inheritance in these cases. We design the experimental protocol and we write up uh, the project proposal based on the KKSH IRP rules and regulation. We consent patients and, con uh, and collect samples. Um, in most cases, we collect uh, DNA from uh, blood, but we can, um, uh, we can collect from any tissue that we are interested in. Then we extract the genetic material and start our experiments in the lab. To recap on these steps, uh, how scientists and clinicians work together. So if we get approached by one of the clinicians, the first thing we need to do is identify the, the area or the genetic condition that we are interested in and see why is it interesting. So we have to discuss together uh, with the clinicians why they think that this case is interesting and we can actually, uh, how we can uh, benefit from it and how we can benefit the patient out of it as well. We collect family uh, history and draw pedigree, and I'm, and I'm emphasizing on the pedigree here because it's a really very important um, uh, part of uh, any genetic study. A wrong pedigree would completely mislead uh, the research protocol. And uh, we are lucky in the research department, we have a really uh, good professional team of um, uh, coordinators who can actually help with this. We then discuss uh, what's the uh, investigation uh, work plan. Uh, we put the strategy of uh, uh, our experimental work in the lab. And then once we have the results and we analyze everything, we jointly prepare manuscripts for publication. So this is how the scientists in the research department and the clinicians in the hospital, uh, we can work together to achieve something. So why do we need to take family history? As I said, it's very important for any genetic study to know the pedigree and the family history. So family history help us decide on the inheritance of the condition. Normally, like when we don't know anything, it's actually a hypothesis, not just uh, not an established fact. So we, we keep an open mind about the mood of inheritance, but we, we have to start somewhere. 
We then uh, assign the mode of inheritance um, um, based on the, um, uh, we use the mode of inheritance, inheritance to assign uh, individuals within the family who are actually at risk of developing the disease. So this helps us for future genetic counseling. Then we help also the, with the pedigree, we can actually refine the diagnosis. Um, we also um, assist, sorry, this is repetitive, but we can also assist the likelihood of more individuals to be affected within the same family. So uh, what else we get from the pedigree? It can, pedigree can affect the treatment management strategy for, the, uh, for that particular family with that particular condition. I'm just gonna mention a couple of uh, research projects that we currently uh, are active and we are working on in the research department, just an as, as an example, but we have so much more. So first I'm gonna be talking about the genetic, uh, uh, um, one of the projects which investigates glaucoma, unilateral and bilateral glaucoma. The second project that I'm gonna mention here is molecular characterization of retinoblastoma. So to uh, discuss the first one, uh, the aims of this project is to use uh, PCR and direct sequencing uh, techniques to identify mutation in the CYP1B1 uh, gene, which is the most common uh, gene to cause um, uh, glaucoma. Of these results that we're gonna get, we're gonna study the genotype-phenotype relation, correlation. So this is just a very simple uh, aims. Currently what we do, we uh, collect all the clinical um, 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 description from the glaucoma clinic. We collect blood and perform DNA extraction. We amplify and uh, PCR and sequence the um, CYP1B1 um, uh, gene to look for mutations. Then we use this mutation to uh, discuss with the clinicians and describe the genotype phenotype correlation between these cases. And we can actually use this information to investigate for um, uh, carriers, um, patients who are likely to develop disease even before like, you know, they, they actually show it. And all this information with the mutation, with the, with the genotype phenotype correlation will help us to understand the, um, uh, the disease better in this population. The second project that is uh, currently active in the research department is uh, to investigate retinoblastoma. So this is a big project. Um, we have lots of cases of retinoblastoma. I think it's the largest in the country. Um, I think the number is around 800 cases so far. Um, so the aims of this uh, project is to um, uh, identify mutations in the RB1 gene which causes retinoblastoma. We need to identify the germline and the somatic uh, mutations in this gene. We're gonna study the expression profile of, um, uh, of RB and um, of retinoblastoma tumor tissues. We'd, we're gonna apply the whole genome uh, expression analysis, which is the latest technology available here. And also we're gonna study the genotype phenotype correlation in these retinoblastoma uh, patients. The workflow is a bit more complicated in this case because we are exploring different parts of, um, of uh, the disease. So it's not as straightforward as the uh, glaucoma story. I'm just putting two examples that just to show you that we can actually do uh, one simple uh, project that can actually be straightforward with no like, you know, um, complications, although we can still explore more on the glaucoma, so don't get me wrong. But uh, the retinoblastoma, we are already trying to explore much more. So with the retinoblastoma story, the way we are going right now is that we are collecting patient samples. We have tumor and we have blood samples. So the tumor is to uh, study the somatic mutations and the blood to start uh, to study the uh, germline mutations. We are extracting DNA and RNA. We're gonna use the RNA to uh, uh, perform uh, whole genome expression studies to identify coding, um, uh, to identify coding and splicing SNPs which might be associated with the disease, and also study the whole expression profile of uh, genes in in the tumor tissues. All this will lead to a better understanding of the disease. From the DNA, we're gonna perform a germline. Um, to we we're aiming to identify the germline mutations. 
by uh, direct sequencing or using the MLPA uh, technique, which detects large deletions in the gene. And we're going to um, use that to identify maybe like patients at risk. Uh, we'll try to perform, uh, we'll perform genotype phenotype correlation, and we'll try to use this data for uh, uh, counseling of these families. This uh, spider shaped uh, uh, schematic is just to show you that we do have a core uh, project. We can have a big core project in which we can try to study so many things. So from the retinoblastoma project, we already studying the uh, mutation. We're doing the mutation screening. We're trying to do uh, uh, expression profile. We try to do genotype phenotype correlation. And there is still, we are identifying more and more areas where we can actually investigate and we can apply, we can have so many projects come out of this one idea. So you don't just use genetics just to do one line of experiments, but we can actually expand more and more. And there is so many examples in ophthalmology where we can actually do that. I would like just to show you here a picture of our lab in which we have uh, lots of facilities right now. Um, uh, I think lots of people don't know that we actually have a lab and we're working here, but we are. We do have a lab and we do, uh, we're doing right now, we're doing almost 90% of the work that we are um, supposed to do. There is um, more coming and we are expanding. We are recruiting more people. So hopefully, you will hear more about us uh, in the near future. What's coming soon in the next month, I think, uh, is the DNA sequencing unit. So right now we are doing the sequencing um, uh, with the, like, you know, as a service with a company. But in the next month, uh, we will have our own uh, lab where we can actually do the work here. So um, I'm just trying to link to my uh, colleague's uh, next presentation is what do we do with the, the genetic information that we have? So what's beyond gene and mutation identification? Once we identify a novel mutation, we can actually study that to see the effect of this mutation on the protein and see what does it do and how does it actually uh, cause the disease. If we are identifying a novel case with a novel gene, then we can actually st study the uh, role of this gene in, in the pathogenicity of the disease. So we can apply so many functional studies like RNA expression and protein work to study and understand the disease even more uh, better which also like, you know, will help in understanding and maybe developing therapeutic protocols for the, for the patients. Thank you very much. The nice project that she recently finished was looking at patients with RB who are resistant to chemotherapy. And with a hypothesis, maybe there's an unusual gene in these patients. And the two patients that she analyzed, she found two novel mutations that have not been described in the literature so far. And so there are many such patients. So these are all these little spiders coming off the main body of the, the big large core project. And also she recently got funded by CAX uh, for her large uh, uh, project on retinoblastoma. So we're waiting, awaiting funding, but it's been approved by CAX. Any questions for her? So, uh, so this uh, facility is available both for, you know, hopefully diagnosis, uh, we'll have the sequencer and also for research ideas, uh, whether it's related to uh, you know, cornea, retina, or any other uh, subspecialty, uh, uh, please talk to her uh, if you have any ideas, and we'd be more than happy to help. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Alka, and she's going to speak. Uh, she's our uh, research scientist who's uh, helping with cell biology and with stem cell research. Uh, Dr. Alka has uh, a PhD in a cancer background, but uh, really trained as a cell biology with a postdoc in, uh, in New York and was at uh, King Saudi University and joined us about a year ago. And uh, she's going to talk to you uh, about cell biology, proteomics, uh, the, uh, and some degree of functional genomics that uh, she's being, she will start working on and that she's been working on uh, in the lab. So Dr. Alka, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Deepak. And thank you, Dr. Lane. That was a um, good entry into our lab. And good afternoon, everybody. 
So I think we are ready to take on the second part of the talk now, which is uh, about translational research. So um, bridging the gap between research and practice is a good description we could um, use for translational research. And it is an interdisciplinary effort between the scientific and medical teams. And surely it's driven by the clinical need. Some of us, uh, for whatever reasons, might say bridging the gap is not for me. We could be too much into our lab research or we could be very, very clinically oriented. But there might be some others among us who would be very quick to remind us because of their eye on the mission, uh, they will remind us of the current therapeutic trend which uh, is mainly leading towards uh, and has a large emphasis on molecular and cellular therapies which include small molecules, antibodies, gene and cell therapy. So small molecules are really uh, chemical inhibitors which can rapidly diffuse into the cells and help to regulate biological processes for a targeted outcome. And uh, anti-VEGF is an antibody which does not need much introduction and it has revolutionized the field of retina and is paving the way for exploration of new molecular targets uh, to overcome the anti-VEGF limitation. Gene and cell therapies have the potential to address uh, as yet critical unmet needs. And each of these modalities has a distinct characteristic and important biological and clinical implication. So, um, uh, that, so essentially, uh, to summarize, uh, translational research really bridges the communication and experience gap between basic and clinical research and vice versa. And it involves um, understanding of the mechanistic basis or the disease progression uh, we could identify biomarkers for diagnosis and prognosis as well as uh, molecules as drug targets. Additionally, we can also identify relevant patient populations for specific therapies. So uh, before I go any further, I would like, a, like to remind ourselves uh, of the Vastin story. I feel that it's a very good example of uh, good communication and translation of the basic research findings into the clinic. Let's see how far back it goes. It started in 1939 when the existence of secreted factors uh, that promote growth of blood vessels was first proposed. In 48, it was suggested that a diffusible factor X from the retina stimulates neovascularization as we see in diabetic retinopathy. Later on in 1971, Judah Falkman proposed the idea that angiogenesis can be targeted. Mainly this was, they had the, uh, the tumor in mind and that's where they were going with it. Finally in 89, VEGF was identified. And in 92, it was demonstrated that hypoxia could upregulate VEGF expression. Now, this finding of high levels of VEGF in ischemic areas uh, a lab finding was very beautifully translated in 1994 by two groups uh, into the clinics. Uh, s what they did was they were able to show that the VEGF levels that were increased in vitreous humor of patients with diabetic retinopathy. And then further on in 95, there was proof of concept in the mouse model where uh, inhibition of VEGF suppressed neovascularization. Finally, in 2004, the first anti-VEGF drug, Bevacizumab, which is a monoclonal antibody, as we know, was approved, but it, this, it was for cancer. In 2006 came Lucentis, or Ranizumab, which was developed for intraocular use. So uh, that's... Um, that's a good example of how good communication between the lab and clinics can have a very good and significant impact on uh, patient uh, treatment and management. So 
translational research is really um, ha is inclusive of a lot of aspects. But uh, today, what we are going to focus on really is how to take the clinical observation to the research labs and understand them better, Th which would lead to, like we mentioned before, an understanding of the disease process and identification of the biomarkers or drug targets or identify patient population that might respond better to a certain therapy. So let's see where we can begin. So the disease tissue holds a lot of information as we know it. And Dr. Lean has also shown how the blood can tell us a lot. So now let's focus on the tissue itself. So how do we get this information? The information can be extracted uh, by examining molecular changes in the disease tissue at the genetic level, as you've seen, and also at the transcript or protein level. When we're talking about disease tissue in um, ophthalmology, uh, we're really talking about different biopsy specimens that are either discarded or sent to pathology. And we also have um, the luxury of using ocular fluid, which is uh, rich in information. So if um, if you come close to any of these tissues in your practice, then you can essentially interrogate them at the transcript level changes or for transcript level changes or protein level changes. So the transcript level changes can be uh, readily uh, assessed by real-time PCR and the protein level changes can be assessed by uh, different techniques. I've just numbered a couple, a few here such as immunohistochemistry, as you can see here, or ELISA, or Western blotting techniques. Uh, these techniques would help you in a candidate molecular approach. Like, if you know your molecules and uh, your genes, then you would use these techniques. But uh, sometimes people like to, uh, or it is very important to know more, and in those cases, uh, you would use a high throughput uh, technique such as gene expression or uh, proteomics and uh, investigations as such. So these findings uh, from uh, the transcript level changes or protein level changes or these investigations can be taken further for a cell biology workup, uh, which we plan to start very soon. So what you would do here is you would start again with either a disease or a normal tissue biopsy and you could either use these to generate uh, cells in-house or if it, that's not possible then uh, you could uh, buy commercially available cells and take them on to the uh, uh, DNA level analysis where you would validate mutations that you have uh, seen how these can be identified from Dr. Lean's talk previously. And uh, we could take them to the cell biology and see how we can validate and characterize them. Or you could take it to the RNA level for a gene expression analysis, take it to the protein level, again, for an ELISA or a Western blot. And most importantly, you could go on to do mechanistic studies. Um, what we could do here is we could try to see how the disease state actually affects like certain functions. I've put two examples here. One is like if the disease state affects the migration. So you could do assays in cell culture to try and see how that is affected, how the movement of the cell is affected. Or you could look at cell signaling. And I've put two examples here is like you could tag the protein of interest and see how it is trafficked between the cytoplasm to the nucleus, as in this case, or from the nucleus to the cytoplasm, as in this case. So that would give you a lot of information at a really molecular level, and you would also know who's talking to who and who's behaving in the cell and who's not. So just to bring us back to this slide, uh, where we said that, you know, the reason we are doing all these things is to lead us to understand the disease better and identify markers, drug targets, or patient populations. And most importantly, in our setting here, where we have uh, uh, 
clinical fellows who are interested in research, the most important thing we look for as an outcome is that you uh, gain the uh, familiarity to the research language and methods, and you would also uh, gain familiarity to designing uh, research experiments and uh, also to, the, uh, to how a hypothesis can be tested. Where can we really begin, right? So this is what uh, you need to do. You need to identify your interests. This can be done either from literature or your clinical observation. You can think about, uh, you would have to think about what tissue you would like to use to study and then think about the question you want to study. This is what we can help you with. We can do this together. So we can create a research hypothesis based on your observation, based on your interest, and based on what you want to study. And then uh, define objectives. We can design the experimental protocols to address your question appropriately. And the next step would be to try and get IRB approval. After the IRB approval, like Dr. Lean mentioned previously, we have a very good clinical coordination team that can help us with your sample collection, con patient consent, et cetera. So then you're ready to perform the study, get your data, analyze it, and bring it to the manuscript stage. I have here, um, as, a, as an example, one of our studies that's um, going on in the lab. So uh, everybody is familiar in this room about Ahmed glaucoma valve implants, which are widely used uh, for lowering intraocular pressure. So the observation is that 50% uh, of these valves have a failure in about five years. And this is due to a scar tissue that is formed over the drainage device. So what is the research question? The research question would be, what are the underlying reasons for the increased hydraulic resistance that you, uh, that you see in these failed implants? Now let's see how we could form a hypothesis. So we could say that um, the, the gene expression in the fibrosis pathway, because as you know, it's a scar tissue, so most likely, uh, the fibrosis pathway might be involved, so you can form a hypothesis and say that gene expression changes in the fibrosis pathway may be underlying this pathology. So once you have that clear, the objective becomes very obvious, is you want to now examine expression of the fibrosis genes in the capsule of the failed AMAD valve, uh, glaucoma valve implants. And it's very important that when you have done this workup to also know where you want to go and uh, have an idea of what kind of outcome you're looking for. In this case, we're looking for alterations in the fibrosis-related genes, and uh, we want to identify genes that are up and down regulated. So then further you choose what method you're going to use. So in this case, we could use real-time PCR to study the fibrosis genes. Um, I want to uh, bring your attention to what tissue you could study. So if it's only blood that you're going to be able to get, then you would start with the DNA mutation study, as you've heard. So you'd look for gene level changes. But if you're able to, uh, if your disease allows you to get other specimens, such as the cornea, conjunctiva, iris, trabecular meshwork, or tumors, or if you can get ocular fluids such as tears, aqueous humor, or vitreous humor, you could think of uh, looking at transcript level changes or protein level changes. Um, I hope um, we've been able to give you the workup, and this brings me to my summary slide where, uh, of both our presentations really, where I hope we've been able to show you how uh, we could use various molecular tools to uh, examine how our genes and gene products interact among each other in health and disease. And uh, the idea mainly is that uh, you would be more familiar 
once you uh, enter the lab and take on this proj such projects, you would be more familiar with the idea and method of testing hypothesis. And I hope we've convinced you enough and you could put your thinking caps on and come to us with your ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alka, and then Dr. Alka has been busy and also has recently got a tax grant approved uh, to study uh, the trabecular meshbook cells in uh, congenital glaucoma. I'm very proud of that, and then I think uh, working hard and trying to get the other Amadval project going. So if there are any uh, tissue-related uh, gene expression type, protein expression type projects that you have in mind, uh, please contact Dr. Alka and talk to her about that. There always are challenges uh, in conducting research. And what I would like to do is uh, present some of the strategies and hopefully solutions uh, to research issues that we might face uh, while doing research here at KCASH. How do I get this up here? A challenge, right? Okay. And there we go. Thank you. So uh, this is what I call the research cycle, and I think you saw this in the slide presented by Dr. Iftikhar uh, last time. Uh, you know, you start by conceiving an idea or project, uh, you do a literature review, uh, you study, uh, design the study, and calculate sample sizes, you develop your proposal, you do an IRB submission, data management, data analysis, interpret the data, and submit it to a journal hopefully gets accepted, and then you start your next project in the next cycle. So I'm going to touch on each of these points to see what the cha uh, potential uh, challenges that we have. Uh, we've gotten input from the people in research and from others around, and then I'll, at the end, present a short survey I gave to the fellows and uh, try to see what, what feedback we got from them and what challenges they face. So the first step, uh, conceiving an idea and our, our project itself, and uh, we've often found that this is a, a challenge for uh, residents and fellows uh, especially, and for new faculty members um, uh, to come up with an idea. And of course, uh, you know, you're not expected to come up with an idea uh, right in the beginning, uh, and that's what mentors are for. So this is one of the biggest uh, main solutions for this is to get a hold of a right mentor. And you have excellent mentors uh, on staff uh, who can help you uh, 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 get a question to place, uh, and also then help you develop the project. Uh, you can also uh, de develop the idea by, you know, when you talk to each other, by sharing information. Uh, there's no substitute to reading the literature to try and come up with questions. And questions come up uh, during journal clubs, uh, during a CTR, during discussions uh, at different types of meetings, and all of these are sources of developing a, an idea or a project. So keep that in mind, but I think most important of these for new, pe new fellows and residents is a, to find a mentor who can help you with an idea. Uh, the other challenge that uh, we've often had when there's an idea is to try and really come to a point where you frame your aim or objective in form of a question. Uh, so you have an idea, you're excited about it, but then you really need to figure out what exactly are you going to do with it, an idea. So for example, we've had, uh, I've had uh, fellows come to me to, and others talk about, we you know, we've done a lot of DALC cases at KKISH, uh, and I think we really should be studying it. But uh, you really need to develop a research question. What are you trying to ask? Are you trying to ask the question, is the visual acuity uh, following DALC better than those in, uh, who undergo PKP? Uh, or are you trying to s uh, answer the question, are outcomes of DALC uh, using visual acuity as an outcome better at KKH than what is reported in the literature? Or does DALC have fewer complications than PKP? Uh, your study design will, uh, your, your protocol or your uh, d development of the method is going to depend on how you're going to answer these questions. The nice thing about ophthalmology is we have a lot of ways to measure things. We always measure things, visual acuity, you know, intraocular pressure, macular thickness, uh, optic disc size. So 
it, it's a good uh, w way to do a lot of measurements, and so we can have a lot of outcome measures where we can actually give a number to, which is good. Um, the next step uh, that is often challenging is literature review. I think all, most folks uh, here in this room, especially when you're residents, you are, uh, you've written a thesis, you know how to do a res uh, good literature review. Uh, but uh, while reviewing projects, we found that sometimes they're incomplete or non-focused. You kind of dump everything into the project uh, without being uh, focused on your research question that you formulated. So the solution really is, I think you know the solution, is really to read extensively, focus on the study questions, talk to your mentor, uh, use papers that have citations to it. Like I think I mentioned this before, one easy way to find out if papers have, cit uh, cit uh, have citations is just put, plug them in Google Scholar, and it can tell you how many citations are there for each paper. Uh, there are more sophisticated ways of knowing it, but I think that's the simplest way to do it. Look at the source papers, where the uh, uh, original study came from. Uh, Review papers are nice, easy to get a gist of all the information, but I think you really want to go to the original papers to, uh, which, re which relate to your study question. And while you're doing your, 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 your literature review, you really want to point out the knowledge gaps. And I tell uh, people who have trained is, you ne really need to act like a lawyer here. Uh, you need to point out where the deficiencies are and, and wh why you're doing the study, what was the knowledge gap, why are you doing the study? And not just to start with, say, if you're studying DALC, for example, you start with, you know, DALC, PKP was described in 1938. That's not relevant to the study. You really want to focus on the point on the literature that uh, is addressing your question. So one, I always give this very nice example of a literature review. This was ever done by Mike Cass from WashU uh, University in St. Louis. Uh, if you look at the ocular hypertension treatment trial. Um, can I have that slide back again? I think we are in a dark mode for some reason. Something I should be doing or coming up? You guys can read it. So here is a very nice way that Mike Cass uh, pointed out the knowledge gap, showed the studies that showed uh, ocular hypertension was protective for glaucoma, those were that were not, and pointed out the limitations of previous studies uh, related to varying endpoints, limited treatment size, and sa small sample size in previous studies, and thereby came up with a very nice protocol that has given us really good answers to how we should be approaching patients with ocular hypertension. So I think that's a nice way to look at a study. Now, uh, the next challenge, of course, is always study design and, of course, the big uh, issue of sample size. Um, you know, again, if you design the study to answer the question, uh, it really needs to design, uh, be very specific to that question you're going to try to answer. Uh, for example, whether you're collecting retrospective data or prospective data, and I think Dr. Ahmed uh, Iftikhar talked to you about that in detail last time. Now, one of the errors uh, is, uh, that we found often is that you leave the sample size open-ended. You say, well, I'm going to investigate cases, uh, a thousand cases. Uh, and, you know, a thousand is not always the best number. We don't know that. So just choosing huge numbers just because they're available may not really g uh, uh, give you the answer. Uh, you may get the answer with much fewer cases than what in the literature. So more is not better here, bigger is not better here. So uh, you can uh, use rational ways, even in a retrospective study, to can calculate your sample size that would give you an answer. So where you have no previous data, as the statisticians will tell you, a number of 50 is good. You know, a thousand may give you the same answer as 50 in some instances. And you can use sample size collection uh, calculations both for retrospective and prospective studies. So when you write the proposal, of course, once you have the question, it becomes reasonably easy to put down the methods. But I think there are some practical issues that you really want to uh, pay attention to, and we have found this as a gap when, as we review things in the IRB and also at, at the level of uh, reviewing the scientific merit. Uh, look, uh, attention to who your subjects are. Uh, do you have enough patients in, in the hospital that you can answer the study or too many? Now, if you're going to review 4,000 patients who come to the ER uh, in a study, it's really hard to do a study like that because uh, it, you know, the logistics become uh, a nightmare. Uh, how are you going to recruit your patients? You know, uh, are there enough st patients uh, that you can uh, 
spend time in the clinic to recruit, who actually is going to recruit the patients? I, I, do you have the study numbers? Uh, is the clinical coordinator going to do it? Are your, is your study team going to do it? Try to get that all solved out before you start the study. And I think all of us have fallen into, into this trap thinking that we've had this and I've, we've had run into trouble because of that. Uh, of course, ask the important question, do, do you, your co-investigators, have the time to do the study? Okay, uh, will it involve expensive testing? And if it does, uh, will the research department support it? Uh, do they have the funds to do it? Do they have the, will they get the stuff they need in time for you to do the study? Uh, do you have the instrumentation to do the study? So you can start a study, you think you have the instrument uh, available in a clinical uh, investigation to find out that it was on loan, the instrument disappeared after that. So you wanna make sure we really have it and we have things to do, uh, conduct a study. And also, of course, I think you heard this in detail by, the, by uh, Nasira and Dr. Rajiv, uh, how you need to understand how you will analyze the data before you start the study. As far as IRB submissions that go, uh, Dr. Oliva gave you a nice overview last time. I'll just repeat some of the things, pay attention to detail. The forms have a number of questions to answer, and uh, you, know, you answer them carefully. Some of them you may not understand what they mean. Ask for help. Yeah, and most often you will. And, this, and once you submit the IRB, uh, sometimes you'll be discouraged when you see uh, that you thought was the best possible proposal you submitted and then it came back with some uh, co comments that you didn't like or didn't care about. Uh, but uh, it'll often come back for revision and it's good. It usually is a positive reinforcement that your study can be improved. And uh, the point that I would like to point out is that you don't give up and keep it in your drawer you provide a timely response, okay? You, you wanna give it, get it back to the IRB in time. Uh, they, they will remember it, uh, that, and uh, you should remember it also, you know, when it's fresh in your mind. There will be few days where you're angry about it, you're not happy about it, you sleep over it, get over it, and then address the problems that you're, and ask for help, okay? There, uh, there's always help available at, with your mentor or in research, you can ask us questions. Data management, again, uh, I think a well-designed case report form uh, is of uh, immense importance. You collect only what you need and what you will analyze. Sometimes our tendency is to collect every little piece of data that we have on the paper. Sometimes it's useful, but most often not, uh, that you, you really don't use the data. And also try to fill out, and if you do have a form, try to fill out all the data you needed, intended to collect. Don't leave blank spaces. Now work with the clinical co research coordinator assigned to you. They'll help you enter the data in the correct fashion in the Excel sheets. And as Dr. Rajiv pointed out, if you leave blank cells in the Excel sheet, data can get screwed up. There are codes to use, and you might not know how to do it. Your coordinator can help you do that. But understand how your data is coded, and uh, I think it's a useful uh, experience to know. Also remember, the data you collect is the property of the research department, and when you leave, uh, you, you, you submit those uh, case report forms or databases to research. The main reason for this is not because you did the work and we want to keep it here, is if questions come after your manuscript goes, uh, goes out and there are questions later on about the integrity of the study or other issues that come up, you're not there, we don't have the data, and someone questions, and that's happening more and more uh, out there in, in the real world, people are asking questions if they can't replicate your study for some reason. And we need to have the data to be able to respond. You might have finished your fellowship and gone on, but we are responsible at that point to, uh, to, to answer those questions. And for that reason, all case report forms and data should be, and the database should be property of the research department. Data analysis, again, uh, uh, as Dr. Rajiv very nicely pointed out to you before, that you really need to have everything decided before and of course communicate with, uh, frequently with the biostatistician. We often have issues where there's a lot of exploration of data. We talked about dummy tables. Dummy tables are not, uh, not as smart, really. Uh, and also stick to analyzing the original question. We often get distracted. There are lots of interesting things that come up in the data that you've tried to uh, analyze. You can analyze those, but really stick to your original question, what your primary outcome measure was, visual acuity, intraocular pressure, change in topography, whatever it was, you really want to analyze that first. And it's nice to make a list of questions for the biostatistician before you go in it. I remember the biostatistician is there to help you, may, may understand uh, the clinical question, you need to explain it to her, for her to, ex and then, of course we help you with tables and graphs, but I would urge you to learn how to make them, 
uh, it could be useful in the future. Uh, uh, but the help is always there for you. Again, when you interpret the analysis, uh, you know, just don't look for the p-value. Uh, understand the data, what it's trying to tell you. And I think for fellows especially, talk to your mentor. Please talk to your mentors. They're, they're the ones who can help you understand it if it's a problem. A biostatistician can help you, but the clinical significance sometimes of that p-value, of that data, is your mentor, okay? And also, don't try to over-interpret your results. Try to be careful with that. Uh, because uh, uh, usually when you submit a paper, that's where the problem comes. Submission to, a uh, lot of you are very good. You finish the project, everything is done, and then when it comes to manuscript writing, that's where the roadblock comes. You know, you're, and I think uh, most of the time it's a fear factor, I found. Fear, you've never written something, you're worried about language, uh, uh, it's a roadblock. Ask for help. So we're, we're, try, um, we're trying to develop a second program to help you with that. Remember, we have an online editor who will help you edit manuscripts. Uh, but we're trying to go to the next level once we get, I'm, I'm not going to say what it is right now, uh, but hopefully that will help you better in formulating your ideas and putting that in good English language so that it can be submitted to a good journal. But please ask for help. Either ask for help from your mentor, ask for help from research department. We, we're there to help. But your responsibility is really to try to interpret the results. You know, come up with some conclusions. Uh, and again, your mentor is there to help you with that. And I think the end product of the, all of this is really submission to a journal. Once you've done that, that's where your research project closes at that point. So uh, those were some of the points I wanted to make. So I sent out a brief uh, fellowship uh, a survey to the fellows uh, just to get their feedbacks on what they think about research. And we had about a 37% uh, response rate out of the for, uh, fellows we sent. And so it's not too bad for a survey. Surveys typically have a 50% research response rate, but so I'm encouraged by that. So we looked at uh, people who, and, uh, uh, that who had done research before, and uh, it looks like uh, those who responded had done research before at, at, at some point, and we had only a few who hadn't done research before. And we asked the question, do they think uh, research is important for your training? And most said yes but I don't have a response from the other two thirds, so I don't know what they felt. So um, I, I have my suspicions, but uh, I can't really answer the question. And uh, so most, most of the uh, people had actually performed, uh, written a paper, or uh, 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 written a thesis, and most felt that it was important to their career, uh, which had made me, uh, I helped them become a better physician, I helped them pass their fellowship exam, important for the country, and some felt actually that they, they enjoyed doing research, and I'm very encouraged by that. Um, and if it was no, most people said that they had uh, have found it difficult because they had no previous training, and I emphasize there's help available. Uh, please ask for it, and we will uh, do that. We also asked about barriers about uh, issues in the research department. Uh, one of the barriers we found is difficulty in obtaining medical records uh, on time, that you request for records, they're not available because of uh, shortage of staff. I'm told by medical records now that you actually, uh, they're hiring two people just for research to help retrieve the records. Now when those people are, people are going to come on board, I don't know. Also be aware there's this transition point that's going to come where you have electronic medical records. We will have, I think, the paper records still available till that's available. Um, we also asked for other barriers. Uh, of course, there's heavy clinical load was felt to be a barrier. There's no block time for research, and I think, let me talk to the division chiefs about this. And of course, uh, no previous experience of doing research. Um, the other barriers people felt was the IRB process was difficult. Uh, there was non-availability of uh, staff for advice, and a, a poor uh, response for, uh, from the staff and few and We'll investigate that a little bit more in detail to see what the solutions are. Uh, we also were encouraged that we did have a lot of people responding about the availability of staff, mentorship, uh, uh, statistical help, and help with language issues. So uh, in conclusion in, in, uh, in my talk, I basically uh, want to point out there are challenges, uh, but there are opportunities and solutions, and I hope all of you make use of it so that we can uh, you know, do better research so that we can help our patients. So I'll be happy to answer any questions. Our next uh, uh, seminar is, uh, our next uh, research uh, grand rounds is going to be on the last subject, which is basically 
how to write a manuscript, how to do a good scientific paper, what do reviewers look for, and, uh, and we have some excellent speakers uh, during our next session, uh, and I hope all of you would be encouraged to attend that session. Be happy to answer any questions at this point. No questions? Put you to sleep? <laughs> okay, well, thank you all for uh, being so patient and listening, and uh, hope to see, hope this was helpful to you, and uh, hope to see more research from uh, all of those in this room. Thank you very much.